we left off on the 22nd juz and uh, we are on Surat al Ahzab. Uh, just to preface once again, uh, before you begin reading the Quran and before you approach the Quran, it's best to grab ablution or wudu. If you don't know how to do that, you can visit some YouTube videos on how to grab physical ablution. And then um, once you have that, you set your intentions straight to seek knowledge and bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, so that he can open up your heart and your mind to uh, absorb and inculcate the teachings. And then uh, lastly, you say, Awudhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim So you're seeking refuge from the accursed shaitan, and uh, you're seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his two names, the most gracious, most merciful. Okay. Um, the reading has been going very, very well. And uh, always a bittersweet sign when we're reaching towards the latter times of the blessed month of Ramadan. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to elevate us in our quest for knowledge. Uh, once again, to preface, I'm not a scholar, but side by side with me, I do have scholarly work, Tafsir Sadi, which I highly recommend that you guys uh, check out uh, in your own time. So we go to the tafsir to expand upon some of the knowledge from scholarship and uh, that way that we can uh, build upon the things that we know. So again, these are my own personal reflections. It's not an opinion on the Quran uh, whatsoever because uh, you need to have a, a quite a serious qualification in order to get there. All right, uh, without further ado, let's just jump right on into the reading. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And whoever of you devoutly obeys Allah and his messenger and does righteousness, we will give her her reward twice. So at this point, it was talking about the uh, wives of the Prophet Islam, because there was a, um, you know, there was a little bit of a discrepancy uh, in regards to their living conditions and how they were uh, not not jealous or envious of some of the material world. But, you know, naturally, there was an inclination towards uh, wanting more. Right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the wives of the Prophet Islam that it's it's about the afterlife that matters and they'll be rewarded doubly. Uh, we will give her her reward twice and we have prepared for her a noble provision. O oh, wives of the Prophet, you are not like anyone among women. If you fear Allah, then do not be soft in speech to men, lest he in whose heart is disease should covet, but speak with appropriate speech meaning you can stand firm on your guard in regards to your privacy, in regards to um, who you let near within your inner circle and to what capacity. And abide in your houses and do not display yourselves as was the display of the former times of ignorance. Uh, and during the times of Jahiliya, the times of ignorance, women would basically be wearing nothing and they, they would be open-breasted as well. And establish prayer and give zakat and obey Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah intends only to remove from you the impurity of sin, O people of the Prophet's household, and to purify you with extensive purification. And remember what is recited in your houses of the verses of Allah and wisdom. Indeed, Allah is ever subtle and aware. Indeed, the Muslim men and Muslim women, the believing men and believing women, the obedient men and the obedient women, the truthful men and the truthful women, the patient men and the patient women, the humble men and the humble women, the charitable men and the charitable women, the fasting men and the fasting women, the men who guard their private parts and the women who do so, and the men who remember Allah often and the women who do so, for them Allah has prepared forgiveness and a great reward. And now this is just a further attestation that it's not about whether you're male or female that's important. Rather, what's important is uh, your piety and your commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, when there's this whole uh, question about equality and all this and so on, uh, women, when, men and women are equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards to their piety, which is most important. But in regards to physical characteristics, responsibilities, uh, and so on, we are not equal in that sense, right? And naturally so. Uh, it is not for a believing man or a believing woman when Allah and his messenger have decided a matter that they should thereafter have any choice about their affair. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger has certainly strayed in clear error. 
And remember, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you said to the one whom Allah bestowed favor and you bestowed favor, keep your wife and fear Allah, while you concealed within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. And you fear the people, uh, while Allah has more right that you fear him. So when Zayd had no longer any need for her, we married her to you in order that there not be upon the believers any discomfort, i.e. guilt, concerning the wives of their claimed, i.e. adopted sons, when they no longer have needed uh, have need of them. And ever is the command, i.e. decree of Allah accomplished. Now, mind you, uh, the Prophet was a form of guidance uh, in every aspect, right? So he was used as an example, especially when people were in a state of uh, confusion, especially when um, they needed clarification on certain things. So let's go ahead and check out the tafsir on this just to gain some deeper insights. So this is uh, ayah number 37. And we'll see what uh, Sadi has to say about this. So... The reason for revelation of these verses was that Allah wanted to prescribe a law that was applicable to all believers, which was that adopted sons do not come under the same ruling as real sons in all ways, and that there was no blame on who on, on those who had adopted them if they married their ex-wives. This was something that was commonly practiced and could not be abolished except through a major event. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this law to be demonstrated by his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in word and deed. When Allah wills something, he ordains a cause for it. Zayd ibn Haritha was formerly called Zayd ibn Muhammad because the Prophet sallam, had adopted him. So he was called after him until the words call them adopted sons after their real fathers. And that's in Surah Al-Ahzab, the chapter that we're reading, and that is in uh, chapter 33.5 were revealed after which he was called Zayd ibn Haritha. He was married to Zainab bin Jahsh, uh, radiallahu anha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her, the daughter of the paternal aunt of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It had occurred to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if Zayd divorced her, he would marry her. Then Allah decreed that there should be some problem uh, that there should be some problem between her and Zayd that caused Zayd ibn Haritha to come to the Prophet والسلام, and ask his permission to divorce her. And remember when you, O Muhammad وسلم, said to him on whom Allah had conferred favor of faith by guiding him to Islam, and you too had conferred favor of manumission by setting him free. When he came to consult you about divorcing her, you said to him, advising him and telling him of that which was in his best interests, even though you wish that you could marry her. Keep your wife, that is, do not divorce her and be patient with her attitude towards you and fear Allah with regard to your affairs in general and with regard to your wife in particular, for fearing Allah encourages and enjoins one to be patient. You concealed in your heart that which Allah was going to disclose. What he concealed was the fact that if Zayd divorced her, he would have married her. You feared the criticism of the people, and that is why you did not disclose what was in your heart. But it was more fitting that you should fear Allah and not pay attention to people. When Zayd had completed the necessary formalities of divorce from her and her idda had ended, we gave her to you in marriage. It, that is the basically the waiting period. So just in case if there's any pregnancy or something to that extent, right? We only did that to serve a great purpose, which was so that there would not be any restrictions on the believers with regard to marrying the ex-wives of their adopted sons, because they would have uh, seen you marry the ex-wife of Zayd ibn Haritha, who, who had previously been called your son. Because the words, so that there would not be any restrictions on the believers with regard to marrying the ex-wives of their adopted sons, are general in meaning and are applicable to all situations, but there may be some cases in which that is not permissible, which is before the necessary formalities of divorce had been completed. These general terms are restricted by the following phrase, after they have completed the necessary formalities of divorce from them and their idda has ended and the decree of Allah is bound to be fulfilled. That is, it must inevitably come to pass and no one can stand in the way. 
we learn a number of things from these verses which mention this story, including the following. Allah praised Zayd ibn Haritha on two accounts. Firstly, Allah mentioned him by name in the Quran, and he did not mention any other Sahabi by name. Secondly, Allah told him that he had conferred favor upon him, namely the blessing of Islam and faith. This is a testimony from Allah that he was a Muslim and a believer, both outwardly and inwardly. Otherwise, there is no point in singling him out for favor were it not uh, that what is meant is a particular favor or blessing. And that's pretty profound. The one who is manumitted owes it to the one who manumitted him. It is permissible to marry the ex-wife of one's adopted son, as it is clearly stated here. Practical teaching is more effective than verbal teaching, especially if it is also accompanied by words, for that is light upon light. Having love in one's heart for someone other than one's wife or concubine, so long as it is not accompanied by any prohibited action, is not a sin, even if it is accompanied by wishes for the husband to divorce her so that one may marry her without making any effort to cause separation between them or being the cause of trouble. Because Allah stated that the Messenger وسلم, was conceiving that in his heart. So obviously, uh, this is a good point especially in regards to what actions are, are conducted and, and what not. So uh, the messenger والسلام, kept everything confidential, right? And he let events naturally unfold, meaning he didn't push to anything towards divorce. Rather, he defended it uh, so that, and, and he advised Zayd not to divorce. The, um, the messenger والسلام, conveyed the message clearly and did not omit anything of that which was revealed to him, but he conveyed it. Even this matter in which there was a rebuke to him, this indicates that he is indeed the messenger of Allah, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who did not say anything but that which was revealed to him and that his aim was not self-aggrandizement. And this is also another profound point uh, in regards to the messengership of the Prophet because um, there's several times in the Quran where he is rebuked, uh, this one being one of them. Obviously, the other one was with the blind man. Uh, the one whose advice is sought is in a position of trust, and he is obliged, if he is consulted about any matter, to give advice on the basis of what he knows is in the best interests of the person who is asking him for advice, even if it is contrary to his own desires. He should give precedence to the interests of the person seeking advice over his own whims and desires, and even if it is contrary to those whims and desires. And again, uh, another profound point. You can establish the truthfulness of the messenger at least right here because uh, he didn't have any ulterior motives. And you could see that even though that it would have uh, put him in a position where he was rebuked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he still spoke the truth. Good advice to the one who seeks advice with regard to divorcing his wife includes advising him to keep her as much as possible because that is better than separation. It is essential to give precedence to fear of Allah over fear of people, for that is more appropriate and is better. We also learn of the virtue of Zainab, had, the mother of the believers, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained her to, to marriage to his messenger والسلام, without any proposal or witness. Therefore, she used to boast of that to the other wives of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saying, your families gave you in marriage, but Allah gave me in marriage from above the seven heavens. So, um, you know, a really interesting matter of like playful uh, kind of banter right there. If a woman has a husband, it is not permissible to marry her or to plan or to take measures to do so until her husband has completed the divorce proceedings with her. Divorce proceedings are not complete until the idda is over uh, because before the idda ends, she is still married. So just a beautiful explanation of the due process and some amazing depth into um, that sequence of events. Okay, carrying on to uh, verse 38. There is not to be upon the Prophet any discomfort, discomfort concerning that which Allah has imposed upon him. This is the established way of Allah with those Prophets who have passed on before, and ever is the command of Allah a destiny decreed. Allah, uh, uh, Allah praises those who convey the messages of Allah and fear him and do not fear anyone but Allah. 
uh, and sufficient is Allah as accountant. Muhammad Sam is not the father of any one of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and seal, i.e. last of the prophets. And ever is Allah of all things knowing. So once again, if anybody claims that there was prophethood outside of uh, the Prophet Islam, here the Quran is claiming contrary. So there is he's the seal of the prophets. Now, naturally, we do believe in the second coming of Isa Islam. However, Isa is a Muslim and he will be praying behind the Muslims until he takes over. When he does take over, he is not bringing any form of um, new revelation. Okay. Uh, carrying on, O oh, you who have believed, remember Allah with much remembrance and exalt uh, him morning and afternoon. It is he who confers blessings upon you and his angels ask him to do so, that he may bring you out from darkness into the light and ever is he to the believers merciful. Carrying on. Their greetings, the, the day they meet him, will be peace, and he has prepared for them a noble reward. O prophet, indeed, we have sent you as a witness and a bringer of good tidings and a warner, uh, and one who invites to Allah by his permission and an illuminating lamp, and give good tidings to the believers that they will have from Allah great bounty, and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites and disregard their annoyance and rely upon Allah. And sufficient is Allah as disposer of affairs. O oh, you who have believed when you marry believing women and then divorce them before you have touched them, i.e. consummated the marriage, then there is not for you any waiting period to count concerning them. So provide for them and give them a gracious release. Once again, complete matter of respect in treating women. So in the event that a marriage wasn't consummated, you still have to treat them with kindness. You still have to provide for them and let them go graciously, right? O oh, prophet, indeed, we have made lawful to you your wives to whom you have given their due compensation. <clears throat> and those your right hand possesses from what Allah has returned to you of captives and the daughters of your paternal uncles and the daughters of your paternal aunts and the daughters of your maternal uncles and the daughters of your maternal aunts who emigrated with you and a believing woman if she gives herself to the prophet and if the prophet wishes to marry her. This is only for you, excluding the other believers. We certainly know what we have made obligatory upon them concerning their wives and those uh, their right hands possess. But this is for you, in order that there will be upon you no discomfort, i.e. difficulty, and ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. So <clears throat> there's argument from uh, the opposing sides in regards to why is it that uh, Muslims are limited to four wives, but the Prophet ﷺ has had more. And it's for this is actually addressed completely in the Quran. I'm going to head over to Asadi so he can give us some depth into it. Um, naturally, I have my own reflections, and that's in regards to uh, who the Prophet ﷺ actually married and for what purpose, right? So a lot of his things for marriage was for the purposes of keeping peace between tribal warfare. Um, so there was political stability. There was a uh, widow shift that happened. So people were left alone. Uh, they were they would have been poverty stricken. They, they basically would have passed away, right? It's not like he was just on this mission of marrying everybody. That's not the case. Uh, every single one of his marriages had some type of a purpose or some type of a, a showmanship to the people as to what is, um, what what you could do right so like for the purposes of freeing slaves for the purposes of uh you know providing for a widow for the purposes of keeping those bonds straight this the combining families and so on so let's see what a he has to say here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds his messenger of his favor with regard to what he has permitted to him both of things that he has in common with the believers and things that are for him alone O Prophet, we have made lawful for you your wives whom, uh, whose dowries you have paid. This is something that he has in common with the believers because in like manner Allah has made lawful for them their wives to whom they have given their dowries. Likewise, we have made lawful for you any slave woman you may own from among the captives of war whom Allah has bestowed upon you. Among the booty seized from the disbelievers, such as their slaves and free individuals who were captured, whether they had husbands or did not, this is something else that was common to both him and the believers. 
Another category that was common to both him and to the believers was daughters of your paternal uncles, daughters of your paternal aunts, daughters of your maternal uncles, daughters of your maternal aunts. The words translated here as paternal uncles, paternal aunts, maternal uncles, and maternal aunts also include those that are described in English as great uncles and great aunts. So what is meant is that the daughters of the great uncles and the great aunts are also permissible for marriage. These are the only women who are permissible. From this meaning, it is understood that all relatives other than these are not permissible, as was explained in Surat Nisa. Therefore, no female relatives are permissible in marriage except these four. All others, descendants and ascendants and descendants of one's mother and father, no matter how far the line of descent reaches, and descendants of one's grandparents are not permissible. And that's pretty profound, especially when it comes to um, genetic issues, right? Who migrated to Medina with you? This limits permissibility to those women who migrated with the messenger, salam, which is the correct interpretation of this verse. And we have made permissible for you a believing woman if she offers herself to the prophet for marriage without a, di a dowry, simply by virtue of her offering herself if the prophet wishes to marry her, that is, it is subject to his choice. That is exclusively for you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not for the rest of the believers. That is, it is permissible for you to marry a woman who offers herself in marriage. As for the believers, it is not permissible for them to marry a woman just because she offers herself to them in marriage. We know what we have stipulated for them with regard to their marriages to free women and with regard to any slave woman they may own. That is, we know what is required for the believers, what is permissible for them, and what is not permissible for them of wives and slave women, and we have taught them and explained the rulings concerning that. Whatever is mentioned in this verse that appears to be contrary to that is only for you, O Prophet وسلم, because Allah has made it addressed to the Messenger وسلم, only as he said, O Prophet, we have made lawful for you. The phrase that is exclusively for you, O Muhammad, not for the rest of the believers, means we have permitted to you, O Prophet وسلم, what we have not permitted to them, and we have given to you more leeway than we have given to others, so that there may be no constraints upon you. This is part of the great care that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed to his messenger, and, and Allah is uh, forgiving, most merciful, that is, he has always been forgiving and merciful, bestowing upon his slaves his forgiveness and mercy, generosity and kindness as dictated by his wisdom uh, when they take the appropriate measures that led to forgiveness. Um, it carries on in verse 51. Uh, in this verse, Allah tells his prophet that he is not obliged to share his time equally amongst his wives. The fact that he continued to share his time equally amongst them, even though he was not obliged to do so, uh, would be appreciated by his wives and they would therefore feel content. And that's from Arazi. Uh, there's also another footnote. Um, let me see if I'm missing a hadith first. All hadiths in this text have been checked and verified by the uh, IPH's researchers. It is rare, but it does happen uh, that a hadith is not verifiable within the time frame of researching and editing the book. In that case, a decision is made by the editorial board as to whether or not to include the hadith. It is IIPH's policy not to include weak hadiths or fabricated hadiths in our publications. If a weak hadith is included in any text, it is only because the author of the book discusses it as a weak hadith. So um, there's a reference to a hadith earlier on. Uh, so let me read this. Um, this is one way in which Allah made things easy for his messenger والسلام, and bestowed his mercy upon him as he permitted him not to divide his time equally amongst his wives in the sense that doing so was no longer obligatory for him. And if he did th do that, it would be a voluntary act of kindness on his part. Despite that, the Prophet والسلام, would still try to treat them equally in all ways. And he said, oh Allah, this is how I am sharing out that which is under my control time and spending on their maintenance. So do not blame me for that which is not under my control, love and inclination towards some more than others. An acceptable hadith according to Abu Dawood. Uh, here Allah says, you, O Muhammad, may defer the turn of any of them that you wish. That is, you may postpone the turn of any of your wives that you wish and do not spend time with her or stay overnight with her. And you may share your time with any of them that you wish. That is, you may spend the night with her. 
And there is no blame on you if you share your time with one of those who turn you, excuse me, whose turn you had set aside. Uh, what is meant is the choice is up to you in all cases. Many of the commentators said that this applies only to those who offered themselves to him in marriage. He had the option to defer the turn of any of them as he wished and to share his time with any of them as he wished. In other words, he could accept any woman who offered himself in marriage to him, or he could reject any of uh, the ones if he wished, and Allah knows best. Then Allah explains the wisdom behind that, as he said that, namely giving you leeway in this matter, leaving it for you to decide and counting whatever you do with regards to sharing your time among them as voluntary kindness, will make it more likely that they will be content and not distressed, and they will all be satisfied with what you give them, because they will know that you have not omitted something obligatory and you have not neglected the binding dues of others uh women in islam they have rights right so you have if you do have multiple marriages you have to be able to treat them fairly equally spend time with them equally and so on right uh but because the prophet had more than four uh it would have been almost impossible to you know your your entire day would basically be dedicated just to spending time with one um, and Allah is all-knowing, most forbearing. Okay. Um, let me see. I think 52 is also relevant as well. So verse 52 says, It is not lawful for you to take any more wives henceforth or to replace your current wives with others. Even though their beauty pleases you, accept any slave women you may own. And Allah is always watching over all things. Here Allah shows his appreciation to the wives of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as they had chosen Allah and his messenger, والسلام, and the final abode. Therefore, he had mercy on them and restricted his messenger والسلام, to them, in the sense that he was not permitted to take any more wives. Hence, he said, it is not lawful for you to take any more wives henceforth, in addition to your current wives, or to replace your current wives with others. That is by divorcing some of them and taking other wives in their stead. By means of this verse, they became safe from having more co-wives from divorce because Allah decreed that they would be his wives in this world and in the, and in the hereafter, and there would be no separation between him and them, even though their beauty pleases you. That is the beauty of other women, for they are not permissible for you, except any slave woman that you may own that is captive seized in war. That is permissible for you for the resentment that wives may feel towards concubines is less than that which they feel towards co-wives. And Allah is always watching over all things. That is, he is watching all things and knows how things will develop. And he is controlling matters in the best and most precise way. Uh, there is a footnote here. This is the best way of honoring the wives of the Prophet وسلم, who had been given the choice between life of this world and Allah and his messenger وسلم, in the final abode. And this is in chapter 33, verses 28 to 29, and had chosen Allah and his messenger. So they had a choice and they chose to stay with the Prophet. Uh, wonderful. Okay. Carrying on to verse 53. So, O you who have believed, do not enter the houses of the Prophet except when you are permitted for a meal without awaiting its readiness. But when you are invited, then enter, and when you have eaten, disperse without seeking to remain for converse, uh, conversation. Indeed, that behavior was troubling the Prophet, and he is shy of dismissing you. But Allah is not shy of the truth. And when you ask his wives for something, ask them from behind a partition. That is pure for your heart, uh, for your hearts and their hearts. And it is not conceivable or lawful for you to harm the messenger of Allah or to marry his wives after him ever. Indeed, that would be in the sight of Allah an enormity. So once there was a divorce from the Prophet, uh, you could not marry any of his wives. Whether you reveal a thing or conceal it, indeed, Allah is ever of all things knowing. There is no blame upon them, i.e. women, concerning their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their brother's sons or their sister's sons or their women or those their right hands possess, i.e. slaves. And fear Allah, indeed, Allah is over all things witness. Uh, now, this is probably in reference to uh, the hijab and unveiling. So, you know, let me see if um, 
Yeah. And you would need a mahram. So here's what Asadi says. Because his wives are not to be asked for anything except from behind a screen, and because the wording is general in meaning and includes everyone, there was a need to state who is exempt from the ruling, namely the mahrams who are mentioned here, and that there is no blame on the Prophet's wives if they do not observe hijab in front of these relatives. Uh, not, and no mention is made here of the paternal uncles and maternal uncles because there is no need for them to observe hijab in front of those of whom they are aunts, namely the sons of their brothers and sisters, even though they are senior to them. Therefore, it is more appropriate that they should not have to observe hijab in front of their paternal uncles and maternal uncles. The wording of the, ver of the other verse clearly mentions the paternal uncle and maternal uncle, and it is... Uh, in the light of that, we may understand this verse. Um, okay, beautiful. So uh, pretty much spot on. Maham is basically a caretaker or a guardian. So uh, if you needed that word translated, there it is for you. Indeed, Allah confers blessings upon the Prophet and his angels ask him to do so. Uh, o oh, you who have believed, ask Allah to confer blessings upon him and ask Allah to grant him peace. So you're sending your salawat and salam on on the Prophet Indeed, those who abuse Allah and his messenger, Allah has cursed them in this world and the hereafter and prepared for them a humiliating punishment. And those who harm believing men and believing women for something other than what they have earned, i.e. deserved, have certainly borne upon themselves a slander and a manifest sin, right? So here we go again, protecting innocence and protecting honor. O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to bring down over themselves part of their outer garments. That is more suitable uh, that they will be known uh, and not be abused. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. So once again, we have a, um, a prescription for modesty reinforced here. If the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is disease and those who spread rumors in al Medina do not cease, we will surely incite you against them then they will not remain your neighbors therein except for a little. Accursed, wherever they are found, being seized and massacred completely. This is the established way of Allah with those who pass on before, and you will not find in any way of Allah any change. So in the same way that the previous prophets were ridiculed and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealt with them, he's, he's giving the people the same thing, a fair warning. If you're waging war against the messenger of God, you're waging war against God himself and you're, you're going to lose. I mean, it's just as simple as that, okay? People ask you concerning the hour. Say, knowledge of it is only with Allah, and what may, what may make you perceive. Perhaps the hour is near. Indeed, Allah has cursed the disbelievers and prepared for them a blaze. Abiding therein forever, they will not find a protector or a helper. The day their faces will be turned about in the fire, they will say, how we wish we had obeyed Allah and obeyed the messenger. And they will say, our Lord, indeed, we obeyed our masters and our dignitaries, and they led us astray from the right way. Now, uh, you know, upon personal reflection in modern day times, these are basically like your politicians and leaders. So if they are laxed about certain things like, hey, yeah, you can drink at 21, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says you cannot drink uh, and you're choosing to obey the dignitaries and, you know, that's not the way to go, right? Our Lord give them double the punishment and curse them with a great curse. O you who have believed, be not like those who abused Moses. Then Allah cleared him of what they said, and he in the sight of Allah was distinguished. O you who have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. He will then amend for you your deeds and forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. Indeed, we offer the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they declined uh, to bear it. Uh, uh, heavens and the mountains, and they declined to bear it and feared it. But man undertook it uh, to, to bear it. Uh, indeed, he has unjust, uh, indeed, he was unjust and ignorant, meaning it was a big undertaking, right? It was so that Allah may punish the hypocrite men and hypocrite women and the men and women who associate others with him, and that Allah may accept repentance from the believing men and the believing women, and ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. So now, interestingly enough here, in regards to 
um, the ignorance of man and taking on this burden, right? Uh, remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us he's not going to give us something that we can't bear. So he, we can bear this. We just need his help uh, and his guidance to get through the test. And then he reminds us of what the test is about. So this burden, this whole thing, uh, this challenge that we took on so ignorantly, it's to weed out the, the frauds. Okay. That does conclude that chapter. Carrying on to Surat Saba. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <clears throat> All praise is due to Allah, to whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. And to him belongs all praise in the hereafter. And he is the wise, the aware. He knows what penetrates into the earth and what emerges from it and what descends from the heaven and what ascends therein. And he is the merciful, the forgiving. Uh, but those who disbelieve say the hour will not come to us. Say, yes, by my Lord, it will surely come to you from the knower of the unseen. Not absent from him is an atom's weight within the heavens or within the earth or what is smaller uh, than that or greater, except that it is in, in a clear register. That he may reward those who believe and do righteous deeds, those who will have forgiveness and noble provision. But those who strive against our verses, seeking to cause failure, for them will be a painful punishment of foul nature. And those who have been given knowledge see that what is revealed to you from your Lord is the truth, and it guides to the path of the exalted and might, the praiseworthy. So once again, people um, in the previous times, before the Prophet, they were, they were knowledgeable, they were connected, right? they were um, scripturally versed and they they knew the truth and now some of them accepted and then other ones rejected right for their own motives but those who disbelieve say shall we direct you to a man who will inform you that when you have disintegrated in complete disintegration you will then be recreated in a new creation and again uh, they're taught he Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is talking about the um, disbelieving people right so they're almost kind of saying it in mock he has invented about Allah a lie, or is there, uh, has he invented about Allah a lie, or is there in him madness? Rather, they would not believe in the hereafter, um, will be in the punishment, and are in extreme error. Then do they not look at what is before them and what is behind them, or the heavens and the earth? If we should will, we could cause the earth to swallow them, or could let fall upon them fragments from the sky. Indeed, in that is a sign for every servant turning back to Allah. And we certainly gave David from us bounty. We said, O mountains, repeat our praises with him and the birds as well. And we made pliable for him iron. Commanding him, make full coats of mail and calculate precisely the links and work all of your righteousness. Indeed, I of what you do am seeing. So he was given inspiration on how to make... Um, how to make chain mail, which is pretty cool. And to Solomon, we subjected the wind. Its morning journey was that of a month, and its afternoon journey was that of a month, and we made flow for him a spring of liquid copper. And among the jinn were those who worked for him by the permission of his Lord. And whoever deviated among them from our command, we will make him taste the punishment of the blades." They made for him what he willed of elevated chambers, statues, bowls like reservoirs, and stationary kettles. We said, work, O family of David, in gratitude, and few of my servants are grateful. And when we decreed for him, i.e. Solomon, death, nothing indicated to them, i.e. the jinn, his death except a creature of the earth eating his staff. But when he fell, it became clear to the jinn that if they had known the unseen, they would not have remind, uh, remained in humiliating punishment. Okay, so some key takeaways here, obviously. Uh, the jinn don't have access to the unseen. So anybody that is communicating with jinn in regards to black magic and trying to gain some type of an edge uh, in the unseen world, you're just sacrificing your hereafter for absolutely nothing and you're being tricked. Now, in regards to the jinn here, 
it says that they were in a state of humiliating punishment. So obviously these jinn were not necessarily good jinn and they were in a state of subjugation to Solomon. Um, the importance of that is that uh, obviously he was able to conquer both realms to a capacity, okay, both uh, seen and unseen. And then, uh, you know, uh, this word humiliating punishment, especially when it's a termite that ate the staff, meaning this like lowly thing, right? Just they, they weren't even aware of the termite eating it. And it's not like a termite just, you know, burr, takes the staff out. No, it's not like a cartoon character. I mean, this thing was this thing was gnawing at this thing for a long time, right? So, so, so Solomon, Suleiman, I said, was standing there for a long time while this these termites were going at it, right? So that's just how much these jinn do not know and how much they are unaware and yet how fearful they were of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and still are fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So keep that in mind. There was for the tribes of, of Seba in their dwelling place a sign, two fields of gardens on the right and on the left. They were told, eat from the provisions of your Lord and be grateful to him. A good land have you and a forgiving Lord. But they turned away, refusing. So we sent upon them the flood of the dam, and we replaced their two fields of gardens with gardens of bitter fruit, tamarisks, and something of spare loat trees. Uh, by that, we repaid them because they disbelieved. And do we thus repay except the ungrateful? Meaning not only is your stuff going to get washed away, but on the same token, what's going to get replaced with it is just like bitter, useless, thorny things, right? So your, your whole life can be turned upside down. And we placed between them and the cities which we had blessed many visible cities. And we determined between them the distance of journey, saying, <clears throat> travel between them by night or by day in safety. But insolently, they said, our Lord lengthened the distance between our journey and wrong themselves. So we made them narrations and dispersed them in total dispersion. Indeed, in that are signs for everyone patient and grateful. Uh, definitely worth checking out the tafsir here for verse number 19, just to gain some additional context. So let's see. Uh, let's see what we can find here. What kind of insights? Uh, Sadi can give us. Okay. Seba was a well-known tribe near Yemen. Their homeland was a region called Madid. One of the favors and kindness that Allah bestowed upon people in general and the Arabs in particular was that in the Quran, he told the stories of nation who were nations who were doomed and punished who had lived in the vicinity of the Arabs and whose ruins could be seen and people were familiar with their stories which they told to one another. That made it easier for the people to believe these stories and made them more effective as a reminder. Hence Allah said, there was a sign for the people of Seba in their dwelling place. That is the place where they lived. The sign in this case was that uh, what Allah had bestowed upon them of blessings and what he had warded off from them of calamities. That required them to worship Allah alone and give thanks to him. <clears throat> then he explained what the sign was, two gardens, one on the right and one on the left. They had a great valley that received a lot of rainfall, which resulted in abundant streams, springs, and so on. And they had built a strong dam in order to collect the water. So when the rains came, they would gather a huge amount of water, which they would distribute to their gardens, which were on the right and on the left of that valley. Those two huge gardens yielded fruits and crops that sufficed them and brought them a great deal of joy. Hence, Allah commanded them to give thanks for the many blessings that he had bestowed upon them, including the following. Those two gardens that provided most of their food, Allah made their land bountiful because of its good climate, which was not unhealthy, and because of the bountiful provision that the land produced, Allah promised them if they showed gratitude to him, he would forgive them and he have, and have mercy on them. Hence, he said, bountiful is your Lord and oft forgiving is your Lord. Because Allah knew that for their trade and livelihood they needed to reach a blessed land, what appears to be the case is that it was uh, the outskirts of Sanat which was the view of more than one of the early generations, although it was also suggested that it was Ashan, which is greater Syria. 
he proposed for them, uh, he, excuse me, he prepared for them the means that helped them to reach that land with ease and safely uh, with no fear. There was a chain of towns between them and that land so that they did not need to go to the trouble of carrying provisions and supplies with them as they traveled. Hence, Allah says, between them and the cities which had blessed, uh, which we had blessed, we placed a chain of towns within the sight of one another, and we made the distances between them convenient for the travelers. That is the distance that they knew well and could plan their journey accordingly so that they would not lose their way. Travel through them by night and day in safety. That is, safe and secure during those nights and days, not fearing anything. This was part of the perfect blessing that Allah bestowed upon them, which is that he made them safe from fear. But they turned away from the bestower of those blessings, and from worshiping him alone, they took the blessings for granted and got bored of it, to the extent that they wished that the distances between those two towns between which travel was easy would be longer. And they wronged themselves thereby by disbelieving in Allah and being ungrateful for his blessings. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them by taking away and destroying the blessings that had made from them, uh, that had made them arrogant. He sent against them a severe flood that destroyed their dam and ruined their gardens. Hence, those gardens that had been filled with beautiful plants and fruit bearing trees were destroyed and replaced with trees in which there was no benefit. Allah says, and replace their two gardens with two others yielding bitter fruit, that is something that produced little food and was not sufficient to meet their needs, and tamarisk and a few wild low trees. All of these are well-known trees which match their misdeeds. Just as they replaced gratitude with ingratitude, those blessings were replaced with the things mentioned. Hence Allah says, thus we punish them for their ingratitude. Would we punish any but those who are ungrateful? That is, would we requit in the sense of punishing any but those who are ungrateful to Allah and make his blessings for, and take his blessings for granted? Uh, when the punishment befell them, they scattered in all directions after having been all together. And Allah made their story that was told a tale to be told at night. They became an example and a proverb wh whereby people would say they scattered like Seba. And everyone would talk about what happened to them. But no one learned a lesson from them except those whom Allah referred to when he said, Surely in that there is a sign for every steadfastly patient and deeply thankful person who bears with patience the hardships and difficulties that he endures for the sake of Allah and does not show discontent. Rather, he bears it with patience and gratefully acknowledges the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praising the one who bestowed them and uses them in obedience to him. If such a person hears their story, how they acted, and what happened to them, he realizes that this punishment was requital for their ingratitude for Allah's blessings, and that whoever acts like them will meet the same fate. And he will realize that gratitude to Allah, as ta'ala, protects the blessings and wards off punishment, and that the Messenger of Allah told the truth, and that the requital is true, as he has seen examples of it in this world. Then Allah tells us that the people of Seba were among those concerning whom Iblis found his expectations to be correct when he said to his Lord, By your might I will certainly mislead them all except your chosen and sincere slaves among them. And that's in Surah Sad, uh, which is chapter 38, 82 to 83. So we're, we're, um, we're coming close to that chapter. This expectation on part of Iblis was not certain knowledge because he did not know the unseen and no news had come to him from Allah that he would mislead them all with some exceptions. These people and others like them were among those concerning whom he found his expectations to be correct, whom he called and tempted, for they all followed him except for a group of believers, who were among those who were not ungrateful for blessings of Allah they were not included in these expectations of Iblis. It may be that the story of Seba ends with the words, surely in that there are signs for every steadfast, patient, and deeply thankful person. Then a new idea begins with the words, Iblis found his expectations confirming, confirming that, concerning them to be correct, referring to humanity as a whole, in which case the verse is general in meaning and refers to everyone who follows Iblis. 
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, but he, namely Iblis, had no authority over them. That is, he had no control over power over them to force them to do whatever he wanted. But the divine wisdom decreed that he should have some power and influence over the children of Adam, except what was given to him for the purposes that we might distinguish those who believe in the hereafter from those who are in doubt about it. That is, so that there would be a test and it might be known who is sincere and who is lying, who is faith, whose faith is real and steadfast in the face of trials and tests when devilish uh, spe spacious arguments are put forth whose faith is not steadfast and will be shaken by the slightest spacious argument and will falter at the merest call to the opposition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this a test by means of which he tries his slaves and distinguishes the bad from the good. So just uh, a wonderful explanation by Sadi. Uh, so let's bring it back and carry on. Uh, Bismillah. Uh, okay, carrying on. And we uh, here we are. But insolently they said, our Lord lengthened our distance between our journey and wronged themselves, so we made them narrations and dispersed them in total dispersion. Indeed, in that are signs for everyone patient and grateful. So now, you know, they became a, a figure of speech, right? Uh, and Iblis had already confirmed through them his assumptions. So they followed him except for a party of believers. And he had over them no authority except it was decreed that we might make evident who believes in the hereafter from who is thereof in doubt. And your Lord over all things is guardian. Say, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, invoke those you claim as deities besides Allah. They do not possess an atom's weight of ability in the heavens or on the earth, and they do not have therein any partnership with him, nor is there for him from among them any assistant. Carrying on. And intercession does not benefit with him except for one whom he permits, and those wait until when terror is removed from their hearts, they will say to one another, what has your Lord said? They will say the truth, and he is the most high, the grand. Say, who provides for you from the heavens and the earth? Say, Allah, and indeed we or you are either upon guidance or in clear error. Say, you will not be asked about what we committed, and we will not be asked about what you did. Say, our Lord will bring us together, then he will judge between us in truth, and he is the knowing judge. Say, show me those whom you have attached to him as partners. No, rather he alone is Allah, the exalted in might, the wise. And we have not sent you except comprehensively to mankind as a bringer of good tidings and a warner, but most of the people do not know. And they say, when is this promise if you should be truthful? Say, for you is the appointment of a day when you will not remain thereafter an hour, nor will you precede it. And those who disbelieve say, we will never believe in this Quran, nor in that before it. But if you could see when the wrongdoers are made to stand before their Lord, refuting each other's words, those who were oppressed will say to those who were arrogant, if not for you, we would have been believers. Now, interestingly enough, uh, any single time, any single time, there is a reference to a, uh, uh, the, here, uh, the, the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always says something to the extent of, you're not going to remain a moment after the time. So don't focus on there being you know, when is that coming? Know that it's it's coming and there's no turning back. You, you have no way forward or backward, right? So he keeps shifting your attention onto what's important and the things that you can change, the matters that you can focus on to better prepare for that. Everything else is just useless because it's, it's a certainty, right? Those who are arrogant will say to those who are oppressed, did we avert you from guidance after it had come to you? Rather, you were criminals. Those who were oppressed will say to those who were arrogant, rather, it was your conspiracy of night and day 
when you are ordering us to disbelieve in Allah and attribute to him evils, but they will all confide regrets when they see the punishment, and we will put shackles on the necks of those who disbelieved. Will they be recompensed except for what they used to do? You know injustice is going to befall them. They're going to get exactly what they deserve. And we did not send into a city any warner except that its affluent said, indeed, we in that with which you were sent are disbelievers. And remember, the Prophet ﷺ preferred to be with people of poverty, right? Um, and, and he said how difficult it would be for, for affluence to get into paradise. So uh, notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it was always the affluent who rejected, right? And they said, we are more than the believers in wealth and children, and we are not to be punished. Meaning uh, they have started becoming super boastful, super arrogant, right? We're, we're good. Um, we can take care of ourselves. And it's not your wealth or your children that brings you nearer to us in position, but it is by being one who has believed and done righteousness. For them, there will be the double reward for what they did, and they will be in the upper chambers of paradise, safe and secure. And the ones who strive against our verses to cause them failure, those will be brought into the punishment to remain. Say, indeed, my Lord extends provision for whom he wills of his servants and restricts it from, from him. But whatever thing you spend in his cause, he will compensate it, and he is the best of providers. And once again, remember, zakat, charity, is spending in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, the Quran is continually encouraging you to uh, be charitable. And mention the day when he will gather them all and then say to them, the angels, did these people used to worship you? They will say, exalted are you, O Allah. Uh, our only benefactor, excluding, i.e., not them. Rather, they used to worship the jinn. Most of them were believers in them. So we have um, people that worship angels, and we also have people that worship the jinn. And, it, you know, everyone's going to get questioned. Everyone's going to get questioned. But today, i.e., the day of judgment, you do not hold for one another the power of benefit or harm. And we will say to those who wronged, taste the punishment of the fire which you used to deny. And when our verses are recited to them as clear evidence, they say, this is not but a man who wishes to avert you from that which your fathers were worshiping. And they say, this is not except a lie invented. And those who disbelieve say of the truth when it has come to them, this is not but obvious magic. So all these different excuses, but take a reflective position right now. Nothing has changed, just the presentation of these same excuses. And we had not given them any scripture which they could study, and we had not sent to them before you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, any warner. And those before them denied, and they, i.e., the people of Mecca, have not attained a tenth of what we had given them. But they, i.e., the former peoples, denied my messengers. So how terrible was my reproach! Say, I only advise you of one thing, that you stand for Allah, seeking truth in pairs and individually, then give thought. There is not in your companion any madness. He is only a warner to you before a severe punishment. Say, whatever payment I might ask of you, it is yours. My payment is only from Allah, and he is over all things a witness. Say, indeed, my Lord projects the truth, knower of the unseen. Say the truth has come and falsehood can neither begin anything nor repeat it. Say, if you should err, I would only err against myself. But if I am guided, it is by what my Lord reveals to me. Indeed, he is hearing and near. And if you could see when they are terrified, but there is no escape and they would be seized from a place nearby. And they will then say, we believe in it. But how far for them will be the taking of faith from a place far away? And they had already disbelieved in it before and would assault the unseen from a place far away. And prevention will be placed between uh, them and what they desire, as was done with their kind before. Indeed, they were in disquieting doubt, a.k.a. denial. Uh, wonderful. So that does conclude Surat Seba. Next up is Surat Fatid.
So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praise is due to Allah, creator of the heavens and the earth, who made the angels messengers, having wings two or three or four. He increases in creation what he wills. Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. Whatever Allah grants to people of mercy, none can withhold it, and whatever he withholds, none can release it thereafter. And he is the exalted in might, the wise. O mankind, remember the favor of Allah upon you. Is there any creator other than Allah who provides for you from the heavens and the earth? There is no deity except him. So how are you deluded? And if they deny you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, already were messengers denied before you. And to Allah are returning all matters. O mankind, indeed the promise of Allah is true. So let not the worldly life delude you and be not deceived about Allah by the deceiver, i.e. Satan. Indeed, Satan is an enemy to you, so take him as an enemy. He only invites his party to be among the companions of the blaze. Those who disbelieve will have a severe punishment and those who believe and do righteous deeds will have forgiveness and a great reward. Then is one to whom the evil of his deed has been made attractive, so he considers it good like one rightly guided? For indeed, Allah sends astray whom he wills and guides whom he wills. So do not let yourself perish over them in regret. Indeed, Allah is knowing of what they do. And it is Allah who sends the winds and they stir the clouds and we drive them to a dead land and give life thereby to the earth after its lifelessness. Thus is the resurrection. Whoever desires honor through power, then to Allah belongs all honor. To him ascends good speech and righteous work raises it. But they who plot evil deeds will have a severe punishment and the plotting of those it will perish. <clears throat> and Allah created you from dust, then from a sperm drop, then he made you mates. And no female conceives, nor does she give birth except with his knowledge. And no aged person is granted additional life, nor is his lifespan lessened, but that it is in a register. Indeed, that for Allah is easy. And not alike are the two seas, i.e. bodies of water. One is fresh and sweet, palatable for drinking, and one is salty and bitter. And from each you eat tender meat and extract ornaments which you wear. And you see the ships plowing through them that you might seek of his bounty, and perhaps you will be grateful. He causes the night to enter the day, and he causes the day to enter the night, and has subjected the sun and the moon, each running its course for a specified term. That is Allah, your Lord, to him belongs sovereignty, and those whom you uh, invoke other than him do not possess as much as the membrane of a date seed. If you invoke them, they do not hear your supplication, and if they heard, they will not respond to you. And on the day of resurrection, they will deny your association, and none can inform you like one aware of all matters. O mankind, you are those in need of Allah, while Allah is the free of need, the praiseworthy. If he wills, he can do away with you and bring forth a new creation. And that is for Allah not difficult. And no bearer of burdens will bear the burdens of another. And if a heavily laden soul calls another to carry some of its load, nothing of it will be carried, even if he should be a close relative. You can only warn those who fear their Lord unseen and have established prayer. And whoever purifies himself only purifies himself for the benefit of his soul. And to Allah is the final destination. Not equal are the blind and the seen, nor are the darkness and the light, nor are the shade and the heat. And not equal are the living and the dead. Indeed, Allah causes to hear whom he wills, but he cannot, uh, but you cannot make hear those in the graves. You, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are not but a warner. Indeed, we have sent you with the truth as a bringer of good tidings and a warner. And there has no nation but that there had passed within it a warner. 
And if they deny you, then already have those before them denied. Their messengers come to them with clear proofs and written ordinances and with the enlightened scripture. Then I seize the ones who disbelieve, and how terrible was my reproach. Do you not see that Allah sends down rain from the sky, and we produce thereby fruits of varying colors? And in the mountains are tracts, white and red of varying shades, and some extremely black. And among people and moving creatures and grazing livestock are various colors similarly. Only those who uh, only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge, indeed Allah is exalted in might and forgiving. Indeed, those who recite the book of Allah and establish prayer and spend in his cause out of what we have provided them secretly and publicly can expect a transaction, i.e. profit, that will never perish. That he may give them in full their reward and increase for them of his bounty. Indeed, he is forgiving and appreciative. And that which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad وسلم, of the book is the truth, confirming what was before it. Indeed, Allah of his servants is aware and seen. Then we cause to inherit the book those we have chosen of our servants. And among them is he who wrongs himself, i.e. sins. And among them is he who is moderate. And among them is he who is foremost in good deeds by permission of Allah. That inheritance is what is the great bounty. So we should all be seeking that inheritance. Alhamdulillah, you know, we're sitting here reading the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking that inheritance. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our efforts and increases. For them are gardens of perpetual residence with uh, which they will enter. They will be adorned therein with bracelets of gold and pearls and their garments therein will be silk. And they will say praise to Allah whom has removed from us all sorrow. Indeed, our Lord is forgiving and appreciative. He who has settled us in the home of duration, i.e. paradise, out of his bounty, there touches us not in it any fatigue, and there touches us not in it a uh, weariness of mind. And for those who disbelieve will be the fire of hell, death is not decreed for them, so they may die no... Uh, so they may die, nor will its torment be lightened for them. Thus do we recompense every ungrateful one. Uh, and they will cry out therein, our Lord, remove us. We will do righteousness and other than what we were doing. But did we not grant you life long uh, enough for whoever would remember therein to remember and the warner had come to you? So taste the punishment, for there is not for the wrongdoers any helper. Indeed, Allah is knower of the unseen aspects of the heavens and the earth. Indeed, he is knowing of that within the breasts. It is he who has made you successors upon the earth, and whoever disbelieves upon him will be the consequence of his disbelief, and the disbelief of the disbelievers does not increase them in the sight of their Lord except in hatred, and the disbelief of the disbelievers does not increase them except in loss. So again, two characteristics, and they're back to back. They feed into one another, right? Um, the deeper and of a loss someone is, the more hatred that they build, and the more hatred that they build, the deeper of a loss they're in. <clears throat> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that condition. Say, have you considered your partners whom you invoke besides Allah? Show me what they have created from the earth, or have they partnership with him in the heavens? Or have we given them a book so that they are standing on evidence therefrom? No, rather the wrongdoers do not promise each other except delusion. Indeed, Allah holds the heavens and the earth lest they cease, and if they should cease, no one could hold them in place after him. Indeed, he is forbearing and forgiving, and they swore by Allah their strongest oaths, oaths that if a warner came to them, they would be more guided than any one of the previous nations. But when a warner came to them, it did not increase them in, except in aversion. Due to arrogance in the land and plotting of evil, but the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Then do they await except the way, i.e. fate, of the former peoples? 
but you will never find in the way, i.e. established method of a law, any change, and you will never find in the way of a law, any alteration. Meaning the, the remedy is staying the same, right? It's, it's completely staying the same. Have they not traveled through the land and observed how was the end of those before them? And they were greater than them in power, but a law is not to be caused failure, i.e. prevented by anything in the heavens or on the earth. Indeed, he is ever knowing and competent. And if a law were to impose blame on the people for what they have earned, he would not leave upon uh, it, i.e. the earth, any creature, but he defers them for a specified term. And when their time comes, then indeed a law has ever been of his servants seen. Beautiful. Uh, that concludes uh, Surah Al-Fatih. Next up, we have Surah Yasin. So it begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, Yasin. By the wise Qur'an, indeed you, O Muhammad wasallam, are from among the messengers on a straight path. This is a revelation of the exalted in might, the merciful, that you may warn a people whose forefathers were not warned, so they are unaware. Already the word, i.e. decree, has come into effect upon most of them, so they do not believe. Indeed, we have put shackles on their necks, and they are to their chins. So they are uh, with heads kept aloft, meaning they're, they're, they're walking very proudly. They're filled with pride. Um, and we have put before them a barrier and behind them a barrier and covered them so they do not see. And it is all the same for them, whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. You, and you can only warn one who follows the message and fears the most merciful unseen. So give him good tidings of forgiveness and a noble reward. Indeed, it is we who bring the dead to life and record what they put forth and what they left behind and all things we have enumerated in a clear register. And present to them an example the people of the city when the messengers came to it, when we sent to them two, but they denied them. So we strengthened them with a third, and they said, Indeed, we are messengers to you. They said, You are not but human beings like us, and the most merciful has not revealed a thing. You are only telling lies. Now, let's take a look at the tafsir of this just to give us some additional context, because I, I think that there is indeed a, um, a golden nugget here for us. So uh, this is verse 14. Uh, let's locate this really quickly. Okay, great. Present to them the example of the people of the city when the messengers came to it. That is, give an example to these people who rejected your message and your call from which they may learn a lesson in which you may be ex uh, exhortate uh, in which you may be an exhortation from which they may benefit if Allah so wills. That example is the people of the city and what happened to them with the punishment when they rejected the messengers of Allah. If there was any benefit in identifying the city in question, Allah would have identified it. Discussing that and similar issues comes under the heading of wasting time and effort and speaking without knowledge. Hence, if anyone speaks of such matters, you will find him speculating and saying confusing and contradicting things that do not lead to any conclusion. If you see anyone doing that, you should realize that the path to sound knowledge is to be content with the facts and turn away from discussing that which is of no benefit. So once, once again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing an example, but seeking anything um, in depth that he doesn't provide, uh, right? Unless it's like historically known is following pure conjecture, right? And that can cause deviation. Thus the seeker of knowledge will remain, uh, will maintain purity of heart and his knowledge will increase. This is in contrast to the ignorant person who thinks that his knowledge will increase by referring to views and ideas that have no basis of proof and are of no benefit, and in fact, they will only lead to confusion and distraction and leave one open to accepting doubtful matters. The point is that Allah mentions this city by way of example to those addressed here, namely the Quraysh. When the messengers came to it from Allah to command them to worship Allah alone and devote their worship solely to him and to forbid them to ascribe partners to him and commit sins. Um, <clears throat> 
when we sent two messengers to them, they rejected them, so we supported them with a third. That is, we strengthened them with a third, so they became three messengers as a sign of Allah's care for the people of that city. And so as to establish clear proof by the coming of the messengers one after another. They said to the people, Verily we have been sent to you as messengers. But the people responded in a manner that is still well known among those who reject the call of the messengers. The, mess uh, the people said, You are but human beings like ourselves. That is what makes you better than us. And why were you chosen to be messengers instead of us? The messengers said to their nation, Indeed, we are but human beings like yourself, but Allah bestows his favor upon whom he wills of his slaves. And the most gracious has not sent down any revelation. In other words, they denied the, accept the concept of a message from Allah. Then they rejected the ones to whom they were speaking and said, You are simply lying. These three messengers said, Our Lord knows that we have been sent to you as messengers. If we were lying, Allah would have caused us disgrace and would have hastened the punishment for us. And our duty is only to convey the message in, in the clearest way. That is the way that will explain the matters that need to be explained. Everything apart from that, such as the signs that you demand and swift punishment is not up to us. Rather, what is required of us, which is to convey the message clearly, we have done and we have explained it to you. If you are guided, then that is your good fortune. But if you are misguided, then it is nothing to do with us. So pretty profound here because I was actually um, seeking to, to see if there was additional detail in regards to the city. Uh, but, uh, you know, how I said that there's a golden nugget. The golden nugget happened to be to the contrary, which is don't seek beyond what's necessary. Right. So Alhamdulillah, that's exactly what that golden nugget was. Okay. Um, and we are not, uh, so this, they said, our Lord knows that we are messengers, uh, we are messengers to you and we are not responsible except for clear notification. They said, indeed, we consider you a bad omen. If you do not desist, we will surely stone you and there will surely touch you from us a painful punishment. They said your omens, i.e. fate is with yourselves. Is it because you were reminded rather you are a transgressing people? And there came from the farthest end of the city a man running. He said, oh, my people, follow the messengers. Follow those who do not ask of you any payment, and they are rightly guided. Now, once again here, it mentions an unknown man. And um, let's see what, what Asadi has to say. So a man came rushing from the farthest part of the city, keen to advise his people when he heard the messengers calling them to, and he believed in it, realizing what his people's response to them was. Hence, he said to them, oh, my people, follow the messenger. He instructed them and advised them to follow them and testify that they were indeed messengers. So not only was there three messengers, but there was an attestation from their very own town of a man running. OK, um, interesting. Uh, now, it go, he uh, Asadi goes on to say. Uh, after that attestation, follow those who ask no recompense of you. That is, follow those who give you advice that will bring you good and who do not want your wealth or any recompense for advising you and guiding you, for this makes it incumbent upon you to follow those who are like it. Um, there is only one argument left, which is the idea that perhaps a messenger may call people and not ask any recompense for that, but he is not calling to the truth. So he warded off this notion by saying, and who are rightly guided. So notice the choice of words uh, that this uh, a runner had stated, right? So um, carrying on, he says, because they were only calling to something of which sound reason testifies to its beauty and goodness, and they were not forbidding anything of which sound reason does not testify to its ugliness and badness. It is as if his people had not accepted his advice. Rather, they began to criticize him for following the messengers and worshiping Allah alone. Therefore, he said, why should I not worship him who created me and whom uh, you will be brought back? That is, what is there to prevent me from worshiping the one who is truly deserving of worship because he is the one who originated me, created me, granted me provision, and to him is the return of all creatures. Then he will requit them for their deeds. Um, you know, uh, pretty profound, right? Especially when, it call, uh, when it, it's in regards to like false prophets and needing that additional reinforcement. Okay, carrying on. Um, Follow those who do not ask of you any payment and they are rightly guided. And why should I not worship he who created me and to whom you will be returned? 
Should I take other than him false deities while if the most merciful intends for me some uh, adversity, their intercession will not avail me at all, nor can they save me? So this person that was running was like pretty knowledgeable and very well informed, right? Indeed, I would then be in manifest error. Indeed, I have believed in your Lord, so listen to me. It was said, enter paradise. He said, I wish my people could know of how my Lord has forgiven me and placed me among those honored. Man, okay, so inshallah, when, when we all get to Jannah, uh, we could find out who this person is because he was a person that was guaranteed paradise, but we don't know who he is, right? SubhanAllah. Okay, um, this does conclude the 22nd juz. So I'm going to finish the reading by saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi Muhammad. Kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali wa sahbihi Ibrahim fil alamin innaka Hamidun Majid. Allahumma barik ala sayyidina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbihi Muhammad. Kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali wa sahbihi Ibrahim fil alamin innaka Hamidun Majid.